I get that you're optimistic that they want regulation. They're going to sign up to watermarks, which for what it's worth, Jamie, I think is too optimistic. I think you're being naive there, but we don't need to get stuck naive. in Naive? That. That's a tough uh, uh, word to throw around. Reg- regar- well, regardless. Well, having called me naive, I think I deserve a, a fair shot at responding to the word naive after working in this field for 25 years. Bush seems like normal now because of what followed him. And I have to be very careful about American politics and what I say, but it seems normal. But we have to remember, imagine this, go back to 2000, change 500 votes in Florida. Al Gore is president. We don't invade Iraq and we start global warming as an American mission 25 years ago. Think of where America would be and the hinge of history hinged on 500 votes. So that's the power of the United States. We went to the Bush administration, 9-11 happened, and they went way too far. The pendulum swung way too far. Unilateralism. Remember uh, Donald Rumsfeld saying he didn't care how the prisoners were treated in Guantanamo. I was living in London and he lost Europe with that sentence. Because the idea of the treatment of prisoners pursuant to the Geneva Convention was a core value of Europeans. And for an American leader to just throw that out the window uh, alienated all of Europe, not just new Europe and old Europe that he referred to, but all of Europe. Jamie, I I have to come back because you've slightly poked me with this allegation. Well, you were the one who poked me with the Secretary of State. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So I I think actually my position has always been much closer to President Biden's old position on Afghanistan before his catastrophic withdrawal. Yes. I was a believer in a light footprint. I think the problems of the world come from America lurching from overextended surges to total isolation. Fair enough. And that actually the model is much more Bosnia, where you were much more prudent, as you say, you know, the more soldiers injured on the basketball courts in Sarajevo than outside the fence. Fair enough. You weren't trying to micromanage and nation build. You gave quite a lot of space to Bosnian civil society to build itself up. But let me, let me, let me address that because I know where you're going and it's fair to an extent. But during that time in the critique of Afghanistan and Iraq, this thing became called the forever war, the quagmire, the thing that will suck all American power. And that swung the pendulum too far. And thus, uh, when President Trump came into office, he had this weird agreement with the far left about the quagmire. And we lost our ability uh, until President Biden took power again to see the important role of the United States. So I think you're right. I obviously think Bosnia was done better than Afghanistan and Iraq because I referred to Gore probably not invading Iraq. He would have to tell you, but that was my understanding, is that he voted for the first Gulf War and said he would vote against the second one. Um, so. So these are subtle matters, and and I I was poking you, but the conventional wisdom at the time was that, you know, we need to stay away from foreign problems. And and, I and, think and the problem and the and the problem, Jamie, there for me is I was trying to essentially say, don't do the surge in Afghanistan. The problem is you bring in all these troops, you're going to be forced to withdraw, right? You're going to create this pendulum. If you could have the patience, and paradoxically. Maybe people like Rumsfeld were right. Maybe Joe Biden was right when he was saying that he wanted a light footprint. That in fact, the the best way for America staying the course is being more moderate, more prudent in its involvement in the world. Well, Rory, you're you're an expert on Afghanistan and I'm not, okay? And it's not an area that I consider myself an expert on and I consider you closer to an expert on it. And so I wouldn't dispute anything you just said except to say that... um, uh, It's easy to sit back and organize the perfect balance between intervention and avoidance. It's easy in the aftermath to know exactly what we should and shouldn't have done. Um, People now, for example, say, well, if we had just given the Ukrainians all the weapons in the beginning, they would have not been in such a position. And they forget that two years ago, legitimately, President Biden was managing the risk of global thermonuclear war. He was worried about World War III. 
And from Putin's words, there was a reason to worry about World War III. And so I believe that you know, hindsight and second guessing is, is a necessary part of our democracy. But, but we have to put the context in place. And just as President Biden was asking the Israelis now to remember after 9-11, we did too much. And they should remember that we got too mad. There was a context in which Bush and Rumsfeld and all of them were operating and, 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 and a large Tony Blair uh, effort to do the nation building in Afghanistan. He was the one who led the Bush administration into nation building in Afghanistan. He was the one who believed that we needed to ha have a long war and change the Muslim world. Um, it wasn't uh, just the United States. Obviously, Joe Biden came in with Jake Sullivan talking about a foreign policy for the middle class. And a lot of that seemed to be about learning the lessons from 2016 and trying to win back voters who were a bit unhappy with the amount of money and energy the US was putting into the rest of the world. And Biden signed up to this phrase, the forever war. He pulled out of Afghanistan. He, from the point of view of many people in the Middle East, didn't really stand up for them when the Houthi were firing rockets into Saudi and UAE. And Ukraine is, in a way, uh, the exception in this story. But the, the feeling that the world has is not that Joe Biden has radically reversed the Obama-Trump style. It's that the U.S. is in a slow withdrawal from the world and that Biden's policy in Ukraine is a small exception and a general view that American voters don't want to play the role that they played in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. Rory, it must be nice to be able to declare what the feeling of the world is. <laughs> you said it, there's a feeling in the world. How do you assess that? I'm actually in the diplomatic environment, and I'm meeting with the foreign diplomats, and I'm seeing what they're saying and doing and believing, and I think what you just said is nonsense that the United States is retreating from the world. That Yes, they would prefer some of them to have more free trade agreements and less of a, a use of tr uh, trade. And you know what you've missed here is that there's a new development in the global world. It's called China. And you've assigned the trade policy solely to politics and ignored this fundamental problem that we face in terms of the Chinese role in the world. And the trade issues that you're addressing are mostly about what Jake Sullivan has called the small yard and the high fence. And so to just pick one of Jake Sullivan's remarks and miss the other one, you've left out a billion people and the leader of that billion people country that we believe has believes in a system authoritarianism and is trying to change the world to be a, a good place for authoritarian countries. And the, the diplomats that I meet with believe the United States has done a very, very good job in managing the US-China relationship and leading the world to build AUKUS, to build the Quad, to build the trilateral with the South Koreans and the Asians. And for you to just say there's a feeling in the world that the United States is retreating, I think is overstating it just a wee bit. Jamie, listen, look at the way that Mohammed bin Salman is treating you. Look at the way that Mohammed bin Zayed is treating you. Look at the way that so many African leaders are looking towards the United States at the moment. And give you, give you another example. Right? I, just well, got I a need text to stop from... there because you can't just okay. throw these things out. What Mohammed, <laughs> the three names that you've talked about are begging the United States to get involved in the Middle East peace process. The three men that you mentioned are, are working every day with the United States asking us to do more wanting us to do more. And for you to describe them as dismissing the United States means that you are operating at a very facile level. The, behind the scenes, when the door is shut, when the diplomats are talking and working together, the two men that you mentioned, MBS and MBZ, which you, you called, are dismissive of the United States. That's not what I'm seeing. And I think for you to say that is just a little flippant. Um, well, Jamie, it's difficult to resolve because you're, you're, you're... I'm enjoying this, Rory. It's Carry difficult on. to resolve. You're a professional American civil servant. You're not going to agree with me that American power is waning. Um, I travel a great deal. I see a lot of these people. And the way in which people talk about the United States is very different from the way they spoke in the 90s. Well, absolutely. And your, Chi and, the world and your has failure, changed. Your failure to intervene in Syria, your withdrawal from Afghanistan, the failure to respond to Putin in Crimea in 2014... Your failure to respond to Houthi attacks on Saudi and UAE, all these things contribute. Well, 
uh, as it happens, I wrote a public article about Syria that advocated uh, the use of military power to work with the Turks to do something about it. And so um, on that one, if you're saying you were actually in favor of using military power in Syria, we might agree if you were actually for that. I don't know whether you were for that. Maybe you can tell us, were you? <laughs> I, I was in favor of responding to the chemical weapons. What does that yes. mean? Upholding, you mean upholding, upholding the, red the red line? line. Not, not up, upholding so what, the red line. throwing a few cruise missiles in? What, what, yes. what were you for? Just throwing yes, a few in like a Trump few did. Missiles, yeah. Like Trump did. Yes, if Obama had done that, that would have made a huge difference. And your failure to do that was a big problem. And the use of you here is interesting. We're trying to have a conversation and you're assigning to me the, the role of explaining every single government policy going back 25 years and, and throwing out phrases like, you know, what the world thinks of you. And I just don't think it's constructive. I think we should pick the issue, discuss it, either agree or disagree, but to just throw a bunch of things together, MBZ and MBS are dissing the United States. That is flat wrong. Very good. Over to Alistair. I, no, I, I, I don't want to get I'm really happy just to sit here and uh, I like I like I like people defending their position robustly. That's um, what we do here. That's what we that's what we did in the past, isn't it? That's true. When, when we, and we were pretty good at it back then, weren't we? Jamie, <laughs> one of the things that the um, social media has done since these days in the 1990s of Bosnia and Kosovo is it's undercut respect for authority. It's, it's taken away the old hierarchies of the president, the big news anchors, and created a world of very unstable coalitions of revolt. And one of the consequences of that must be that it's much more difficult to have legitimacy and moral authority. I mean, I was thinking about that listening to you. I mean, a, a lot of what you're saying to me is, you're wrong, Rory. United States is, is the indispensable nation. It's a great nation. Now, that assertion needs to come with a lot of moral authority and legitimacy for people listening to think, okay, Jamie's right. And presumably one of the problems of social media is that nobody trusts anyone anymore. It's created an atmosphere of relative truth where, yeah, sure, Jamie would say that, Rory would say that, who the hell knows, I'm going to get back to X or Facebook. Sure, that's a problem, big problem in, our, in the Western democracies. And what's ironic is that the social media was created um, by Americans in Silicon Valley, uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, uh, you know, Instagram, all of them. And we thought it was a tool to spread democracy. And instead, it's being used against us, uh, against, uh, as Rory puts it, authority. What I would simply say is, you know, it, in the early days, it was thought as a democratization tool that it would enable the the people of Egypt to go to Tahrir Square and 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 talk to each other. That it would enable the Arab Spring it was enabled by Facebook, but I don't believe that the social media tools in the end are the decisive factors. And I don't believe that um, when uh, we figure out a way, it will take time. It's every new technology has a period where it causes pollution, essentially, and it causes damage. And then you have to figure out a way to minimize the damage. I think the, the decline in, in, in support for authority has been going on since Watergate, essentially. Uh, that's when it really changed in the 60s. Uh, prior to that, in the 50s, people believed uh, their anchors, they believed their presidents. Um, the killing of John Kennedy probably did more to ruin authority than anything social media has ever done. Uh, that was when conspiracy theories began, really, in the modern era, when people imagined the CIA was the responsible for killing John Kennedy because he was going to be against the Vietnam War. Um, and so conspiracy theories have been a problem in America for a long, long time, and it's not new. How do you, how do you in this job now deal with the social media companies? Because I mean, I've talked to some of them at pretty senior level, and they they seem to me to be very defensive. Don't really want to be part of the solution is the sense I get. They think that the problem is one for governments, and you shouldn't be too heavy on them. And your and the problem I have with your point about you know you've got to get on top of the technology. The, the legal and parliamentary and congressional processes are so slow. And this technology is fast, and as you see, these as you say, these dictatorships are exploiting it better than we are. So, 
Yeah, it's what, tough. Right. It's so, hard. What, so, what is the conversation you have with the social media companies? Let me let me give you an example why all is not lost, as Rory was implying. Um, the world is not chicken little; isn't coming. Um, in in the <laughs> AI uh, uh, area, the latest technology, the companies that are making them are asking to be regulated because they know that the last time around they didn't do it right. Mm. They've united and formed consortia to ensure that this time around they do better. And I think in AI, there's some ideas for ensuring that there's watermarking, that people knows, know what's a AI and what's real. Um, and, and I still use the word real uh, versus AI. Um, but again, government is slow. In, in America, we have freedom of the press and we have no regulation of the social media companies. In Europe... They have the Digital Services Act. And so I've been working with Europeans because I believe that the battleground is largely in, in the rest of the world that I'm fighting this information war, essentially. And the Europeans have tools that the United States uh, officials like me don't have. And so when we put in this framework to fight disinformation, social media companies must ensure compliance with their terms of service. Mm. That's the whole ballgame. How much effort will they make to um, uh, comply with their terms of service? Will they spend the money? Will they buy the translators? Will they help do it? And Europeans are in, frankly, a better position than I am to make that happen. Um, AI is so incredibly rapid and creative in its generation and its duplication. I mean, it can now generate deep fakes and fake news and manipulate and spew out QAnon theories. 10,000 times quicker than anything we've ever seen before. What is it that you're worried about with AI? I get that you're optimistic that they want regulation, they're going to sign up to watermarks, which for what it's worth, Jamie, I think is too optimistic. I think you're being naive there, but we don't need to get stuck naive. in Naive? That. That's a tough uh, uh, word to throw around. I don't think they have the financial interests in the end to regulate as much as you'd like them to. In the end, they'd prefer less regulation. But... Reg regard well, regardless, well, having called me naive, I think I deserve a, a fair shot at responding to the word naive after working in this field for 25 years, um, having uh, uh, worked very hard in subjects that are very, very difficult. And naivete is something I don't ever remember being called until today. Um, and so with the, what I actually said about the AI, what I actually said about the AI companies was, isn't it interesting that this time around in response to Alistair's point, they are more willing to be regulated and have come together and asked to be regulated as opposed to the last time around when they uh, refused and have caused, I think we can all agree, social media has had negative effects in the information domain around the world. So I was merely pointing out a trend, not saying that everything was wonderful. And so I just, the word naive is just a bit harsh.